Okay, there's only one new idea in this section, really, and that's uh, CPCTC. Um, kind of a mouthful. It's an acronym. I'm going to show you what it stands for. And actually, the, the idea isn't really new, new either. We've talked about this idea. It, it's just we've got a formal rule for it now. Um, so C stands for corresponding P stands for parts of. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Okay, now you could always write out corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. But that's just kind of a mouthful, and so and it's used pretty commonly. So we use CPCTC often, um, just as a short form of that. Okay, and all that means is that the corresponding angles are going to be um, congruent in congruent triangles, and the corresponding sides are going to be congruent. So we've got this uh, this uh, congruency statement here. I can see that angle A and angle D are in the same slot in my congruency statement. So. That means a, angle A is going to be congruent to angle D. B and E are in the second slots. C and F are in the third slots. And we can do the same thing with the sides. So I can see the first two letters there are A, B. So if you b think about segment A, B, hey, those, same two, those letters are in the same slots as D, E. So that means that those two segments will be congruent and can do follow that same pattern. B, C would line up with E, F. And CD, um, oops, this should say CA here. I'll fix that on the form. CA is going to be congruent to, that'd be the third one and the first one, FD. Yeah, so I'll fix that on the, on the copy you have. Okay, so let's put it to use. The corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. CPCTC. All right, so. Is angle A congruent to angle C? So at first glance, hey, they're not marked congruent, but let's see if we can figure out a way to get them congruent. Well, hey, I've got two triangles. So the idea here is that first I want to show that the triangles are congruent. And if the triangles are congruent, then these would be corresponding parts of those congruent triangles. So they would be congruent as well. Okay, so let's see what we can do. So I'm thinking about my triangle congruency theorem so far. I've got two sets of sides that are congruent. Um, but that's not enough, right? I'm, I'm going to need something else, a side or an angle, to get these congruent. And what I can do is use BD as it's part of both triangles, and it's going to be congruent to itself. So I'm going to start by saying that BD is congruent to itself. And that's the reflexive property of congruency. Okay, so this is my little explanation. Um, just doing some shorthand. Really, I'm just saying what what you know theorem or postulate I'm using, or this time it's a property um, that I'm using to show that that's true. True, right? So now I've got three sets of sides. Well, now I can say that the triangles themselves are congruent. So I'll call the left triangle triangle ABD, and I want to make sure that I line up. Hey, A was supposed to match up with C, right? And then B matches up with itself, and D matches up with itself. So this would be um, the SSS triangle congruency theorem, or SSS, just for short, like that. Okay. Now that I've got the triangles congruent, all of the matching parts would be congruent, including these two angles. Now I can say those two angles are congruent to each other. Yes, they are. So I guess my answer here is yes. Uh, but my explanation is down here. Angle A is going to be congruent to angle C because I've already shown that these two triangles are congruent and their corresponding parts of those um, congruent triangles. In other words, corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Okay, so there is CPCTC in action. So you always need the corresponding, the, the congruent triangles first, and then you can use CPCTC. And really, we've done a two-column proof here in essence, right? There's my two columns. So now we'll do some actual two-column proofs, not just um, kind of an informal proof like that. All right, so let's move on to this next page here. I can see I've got my bow tie situation here. I've got intersecting lines. That always makes me think, hey, I'm probably going to do something 
with vertical angles. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. So first, it says given angle E and angle H are congruent. That's already marked in the picture. And it says that G is the midpoint of DF. And then the reason is just because that was given. That was free, right? First reason is always going to be given. <clears throat> OK. So let's, uh, E and H, those angles already marked. Let's process this piece of given info. What is that actually telling me? So this is saying that G is the midpoint of DF. OK. So um, <clears throat> G is halfway between F and D, which means that this is going to cut this into congruent parts. OK. Now, you might think, well, hey, now I've got some sides that I can use. And we have it in our picture, but we haven't put it in the proof yet. Because it doesn't say that those two segments are congruent in the proof. It tells us G is the midpoint. We can use that to say that the sides are congruent. right? So when I want to use um, any sides or angles in a proof, I have to put it explicitly in my proof before I use it in a congruency theorem. So I'm going to say DG is congruent to GF. And that would be, um, I knew that because I know what midpoint means, right? This is the definition of midpoint allows me to say that those two segments are congruent. Okay. So looking pretty good here. I got a side and an angle. I still need something else. And uh, you know, as I was kind of discussing before, I've got these two intersecting lines. So always with the bow tie pro um, problems, you can use... Uh, the vertical angles theorem, those two angles are going to be congruent. Okay, so I'll call this top one EGF. And I'll call the bottom one um, DGH. That's the vertical angles theorem. And now looking at the triangles, I do know now that the triangles themselves are congruent. Okay, so in a lot of the proofs we've done, that's what we're trying to prove. Here we're trying to prove something about the triangles. But first, um, I have to say that the two triangles themselves are congruent. So I'll call the top one um, triangle EFG. And then I want to be careful to make sure I get a match matching up. E and H would match up. So I need H in the first slot. Is or in the, at least in the same slot as the E, and then D and F would match up, and then G matches up with itself, okay? And looking at this, I've got two angles, and this would be the non-included side, right? The included side between those two angles would be here or here, uh, but it's a non-included side. So I need to show that two angles and a non-included side, that's going to be the AAS, angle-angle side um, triangle congruency theorem. Okay, so what I'm trying to prove is that EF, that's this segment, and HD are congruent. That's what I'm trying to prove. Now I can do that because I've shown that the two triangles themselves are congruent and those would be corresponding parts of those two congruent triangles. So really with these proofs, we're just taking it one step further. You're pretty much always going to show that the triangles are congruent. Once you do that, then you can use CPCTC to show that any of the corresponding parts are congruent. So in this case, segment EF is congruent to segment HD. Okay, the next proof is pretty similar. So maybe you want to pause the video and try it out. Um, there are some little uh, technicalities that people often miss on the next problem. So I don't know, you can see if you can spot those. Um, I'm just going to get straight to it. Okay, so I'm not even reading this really. I know that that's my given info, or it should be, so let me double check. Yep, that's that given info. Okay, and um, so let's see, we've got some congruent sides, NM and NK, that's already in there. And then we've got some perpendicular lines, okay? So I have to think about what that actually means. What do those perpendicular lines mean? Um, so, um, what the, it says that um, NK, that's this line, is going to be perpendicular to NP, to, to, well, to segments, it doesn't matter if it's the segments or lines. So those two are perpendicular. What that's really telling me is that I have a right angle right there, right? That those two, two um, lines form a right angle. Then it also says that NK is perpendicular to LK, 
So really what I've got then, when I process that information with the perpendicular lines, what I can do with that is say that these are right angles. Okay. So I'm going to put that in my proof. I'm going to say angle N and angle K are right angles. And since it's the same reason, I'm going to put those both in one step. You could split them if you wanted to. Okay. Um, so I can do that because I know what the symbol means. It means perpendicular, and perpendicular means they form a right angle. So this is going to be the definition of perpendicular. So just to make this quick, definition of perpendicular. I'm going to write it like that. Okay. So now I've got those right angles. Okay. So what I'm thinking now is, oh, hey, I've got right triangles. Maybe I might use a hypotenuse leg, HL. Um, for that, I would need to have the hypotenuse of both the triangles. But wait a second, I don't have a way to find those right now. So that's actually not going to work. So I'm thinking, well, what else can I find? Well, wait, they've got the bow tie situation again, right? So that means that I can get these two angles congruent to each other, okay, by vertical angles. Um, actually, before I get to that step, you could do that step right now. In fact, you could have done that as your step B. So, so a lot of times the steps in the middle are, you can do in a different order. Like in the last problem, I meant to say this up here. You could have done. You could have. You could have switched the order of those two, and it wouldn't have made a difference as long as you get those two things before you get the congruent triangles. So same thing here. You could have done the vertical angles right off the bat. But let me do something with this. So now that I'm, I can see I'm going to be using ASA when I, when I finish this proof, because I'm going to have two angles and an included side. But I haven't actually said that these angles are congruent. Now, it might be super obvious to both of us or to everyone, but we haven't really said technically that those two angles are congruent. So that means we can't use it as one of our angle pairs until we do that. But Luckily for me, there's a theorem for that. I can say angle N is congruent to angle K. And that's because all right angles are congruent. Um, that's called the right angles congruency theorem. But if you forgot the name of it, you could just write all right angles are congruent. Right angles congruency theorem. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll put the little marks just to remind myself that I've done that. Okay, and I hadn't, I drew the vertical angles in my picture, but I did not actually put them in my proof yet, so let's go ahead and do that. So I can't just call those angle M, because I wouldn't know which angle I'm talking about. I'll call the top one NMP, and I'll call the bottom one KML. That's the vertical angles theorem. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, now I can say the two triangles are congruent. Okay. Call the top one NMP. So I'd want to do KML for the bottom one to get the pieces to match up. That's two angles and an included side, so ASA. Okay, and now, you know, a lot of times, again, we'd be ending with the congruent triangles. Not this time, though. We're asked to prove that angle L and angle P are congruent. We can do that now because they're corresponding parts of those congruent triangles. So they are congruent. So in other words, I can finish this with CPCTC. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And that is it for today. Um, I will see you next time.